Hey, it's Jack from Jack Eight the Real Estate and the Online Real Estate Academy. So I wanted to do an additional video about the commission lawsuit and settlement with MLS PIN and specifically focus on the flow of money because I think that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Please remember that I'm no expert on this topic. In fact, like nobody's really an expert because this is kind of uncharted territory. I'm just a guy trying to figure it out. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a mortgage guy. You know, I'm just one guy trying to figure it out. If I miss something, please, or I totally get something wrong, which is totally possible, put it in the comments here, okay? So thank you for your help. Uh, and lastly, let's just remember that the settlement that we covered in the MLS pin video is not in place yet. It, at the least, it would be 110 days from the approval of the preliminary settlement and I don't even think that's happened yet. So, I, you know, I'm just going to ballpark it, assuming there's no court delays, because court delays never happen, right? Uh, Thanksgiving time? Uh, you know, that's kind of where I'm ballparking it. So let's get into uh, how the money flows in a customary transaction currently in Massachusetts. Okay, so let's go to the chalkboard. We're going to set aside cash deals. For the purpose of this video, I think those are less complex and, you know, so let's focus on finance deals where there's a lender, which I think is probably like uh, three quarters of all deals, something like that. So in those situations, you have a buyer. Let's just say the buyer puts down uh, 20% and the lender is bringing 80% of the purchase price. Currently, they give that money to the seller, which represents, of course, 100% of the sales price right of course now the seller under the current system gives the commission to the list agency from a technical point of view the list agency receives the entire commission let's just call that five percent and then they compensate the buyer agency uh from that let's just call it two and a half percent so it's, I think it's very important from a legal point of view and a cash flow point of view to understand how the commission is, where the money comes from and how the commission is paid. The big takeaway here is that effectively the buyer is financing the commission or most of the commission, right? The buyer is financing most of the commission when you're buying with a lender. Now, in the future, as I read the MLS PIN proposed settlement, uh, this is legal now, and it will also be legal in the future. It'll also be legal in the future, but it'll be optional in the future. Uh, so that's where we have the current situation. I want to quickly mention the Northwest MLS, and I want to draw our diagram to show you how they do it there because they've made some changes. They're a little bit ahead of MLS PIN. Let's take a look at that. Now, from what I understand out in the West Coast at the Northwest MLS, they do it slightly differently. The seller gets 100% of the purchase price and then the seller, from an accounting point of view, pays the list agency and then pays the buyer agency. In other words, the list agency does not stand in between and the list agency technically does not pay the buyer agency. That money comes directly from the seller. I'm not sure if that will be relevant to how things shake out here in Massachusetts, but I thought it was a good piece of background information. So let's now go to the complete opposite side of the spectrum. When the seller doesn't want to pay the buyer side agency commission at all. So remember, under the MLS pin settlement, which is not final yet, uh, the seller doesn't have to offer uh, a commission to the buyer side agency under the proposed settlement. So uh, what happens given market conditions, and I think this will be variable with market conditions, what happens when the seller says, I'm not paying the buyer side fee? Uh, no, go pound sand. So <laughs> I know that's going to be different, isn't it? Uh, under that situation, the lender and the buyer would get together to give the uh, sales price to the seller, which would be, of course, you know, the down payment plus the whatever the lender is offering. And then they would pay the list agency. So the list agency gets paid. Uh, Jack, uh, uh, how does the buyer agent get paid in that case? 
Well, uh, in that case, if there was, for instance, an exclusive right to represent contract, then, uh, hint, hint, that might be a good idea, then the buyer would then be able to pay the buyer agency directly. That would be entirely legal. And uh, the problem with that is, however, think about that for a second. Anybody know what the problem with that is? If the buyer just put down 20% on a house and the house is $750,000, do they have the extra 10, 15 grand to write a check to the buyer agent? No, probably not. Now it was suggested to me yesterday, this is not my original idea, but I do think it's creative thinking, that the seller could offer a seller credit, which would be equal to the uh, buyer side commission. And then that would go back to the buyer at the time of closing. And then the buyer could pay the buyer agency. Oh, that's very interesting. Now, in my experience, seller credits are usually limited to those inc incidental fees, proration, uh, those types of things, usually, you know, three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars, maybe max, in my experience. So having a buyer credit for the whole amount of the buyer side commission, uh, is that done a lot? I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I, I'm not sure. That's certainly beyond what I've experienced. And I know there are some caps on seller credits, depending upon which type of mortgage you're going to get. Now, by creating the buyer fee as its separate line item, which is more transparent, also prevents or presents some additional issues, which I don't have the answers for. Maybe if you do, put it in the comments. Because now you are overtly financing the fee. And I always thought that that was not allowed by federal guidelines. I do know there's an effort on the federal level to allow that, but I don't think that's in place now. So I, I don't know about that. I'd be really eager to hear what you have to say. And secondly, it also means that it could in a way affect the appraisal because now the property has to appraise for a higher amount. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's already been appraising for the higher amount. It was just that the commission was covertly included inside of the sales price. Now it's overtly included in the sales. Will that affect appraisals? Another unknown. Then there's the issue of steering. A buyer side agent saying, uh, let's see, there's three houses that meet your criteria. One is paying two and a half percent. The other is paying two percent. And the third one is paying no percent. Oh, I guess we're not going to go see that one. Well, that, that totally sounds unethical on uh, any number of different levels. Okay, buyers might just say, uh, enough of the uncertainty. Let's just deal directly with the list agent. And as you've probably heard from a thousand different people, building your real estate career based upon listings is the way to do it. Very few people build a career based upon buyers. Listings is where it's at. But what if the buyers just go directly to the list agent? Is there a downside to that? Let's take a look. When a consumer has an agent on their side, as either the buyer agent or the seller agent, that agent owes all six of the fiduciary duties. They need to obey legal instruction. They need to be loyal to that client. They need to disclose anything that the client should otherwise know that you know. They must be confidential about, for instance, the reason why they're selling, those types of things. They have to account for the funds, and that seems uh, universal, and they have to take reasonable care. In other words, they have to be professional and detailed oriented. So these duties are owed to a buyer client or a seller client. But if the buyer goes to the list agent directly and the list agent gets them to sign in advance a written state form that is the consent to dual agency. Ooh, that changes everything. When buyers sign, and when sellers sign for that matter, the consent to dual agency, it's basically a waiver of half of the fiduciary duties. In that situation, uh, the agent no longer has to obey the client. They don't have to be loyal to the client. 
and they don't have to disclose information to the client. Oh my, that's a big, big difference. Basically, you're getting at least half, maybe even less than half of the fiduciary duties. Those are kind of the top three duties, right? You, in other words, you don't have anybody really working for you. Uh, I don't want to use this word, but you have somebody that's uh, managing the transaction, but they don't really work for you, really, do they? Is that really good for buyers? Mm, I don't think so. But in those situations where the uh, seller was offering a buyer side commission, it will be really good for the list agent and the list agency because now they will score both sides of the commission. So this could be a windfall. If more and more buyers choose to waive half of the fiduciary duties, list agencies, the people that list property could start to make a lot more money. It could be really good for them and really kind of bad for buyers. So careful what you wish for, I guess. In other words, this is really complicated. I probably left out all sorts of angles that I hadn't yet conceived of yet. Put them in the comments. I would love to hear from you. And uh, we'll continue this journey as the topic evolves and we'll keep you posted. I'm Jack from Jack Ailey Real Estate and the Online Real Estate Academy. Have a great day.